AES IntelliNet is a high quality mesh, and I'm hoping that uh, some of you have at least heard of what mesh is, two-way radio system that allows a subscriber to transmit fire alarm life safety signals reliably and quickly to the central station. Signals follow the shortest route to the central station, and it's the shortest route at the moment. It, it's always a, it, it's a dynamic situation with AES, so it's always changing, and the AES network is always learning how to get there. This is not cellular technology. It doesn't rely on cellular, tech, uh, cellular towers. It will never sunset, and it will never require a mass change out. Um, we built this network in Denver for CMS's, uh, uh, how do I put it? Um, it was for Monotol Corporation and CMS purchased them back in uh, the early 2000s, I believe. Uh, this network was built originally by me in 1993. In 1993, it was really, really new technology and there were a lot of people that were uh, resistant to using it. Now, as you know, there are a lot of folks out there that are AHJs and other municipalities that are requiring AES like Denver. Um, it is a very good technology. It, it is a technology that is still the same now as it was in 1993, the same equipment still works. Although they have new versions of the equipment, it still works essentially the same way. In this system, the way it's working, you have at the left side of the picture um, an alarm panel under A that is connected to an AES fire subscriber unit and that could be any kind of fire subscriber unit. The one that we're really going to talk about today is the AES 2.0 fire subscriber unit, but the technology is all the same. It can transmit from the fire subscriber unit to a burglary subscriber unit. The beige boxes in this picture are the burglary units. They're still UL listed. They still pass the traffic exactly the same way as if it were to transmit through another um, UL listed red fire subscriber unit. And then they pass their traffic to the nearest central station receiver. In this picture, it's the green boxes with the cloud. Um, in Denver, right now, there are 10 receivers. And that's not necessarily just in Denver. That's in Fort Collins, Loveland, Longmont, Boulder, Denver, um, and as far south as Douglas County. Um, those units take about a second and a half per hop to get the signal to the operator's console. It's one of the fastest systems for transmitting an AES or any kind of alarm that you will ever see. They are almost instantaneous. Once a signal goes out, there is no way to stop it. There's checks and balances in the system so that when the fire alarm panel transmits the signal, it has to get an answer back from the central station receiver before it stops transmitting that alarm. So there are checks and balances associated with it to make sure that the alarm gets there since it is a two-way system. It's transmitting out and it's receiving back and it will not stop until that information has been completely transmitted to the central station. It's a very nice technology and it's very sure that a signal will get out or that radio will not stop transmitting. Uh, because there are two-way devices, the checks and balances are there to ensure that the signal gets transmitted and received positively end to end. Um, any subscriber unit can become a repeater unless you turn off the repeat function in the subscriber unit. We never, never want to turn off a repeat function. There would have to be a really good reason why to turn it off. Because there's multiple ways to get to a central station receiver, um, they create what's called redundant routes to get there. Um, it, 
this noise down here at the bottom is basically to give you the ability to look this up if you need to go look it up for some reason. It should be considered a one-way alarm device based on F NFPA 72. And NFPA 72, all of the, the citations are down below just in case you ever needed it. Even though it's a two-way device, it still works similarly to the old one-way alarm systems. Um, one-way alarm systems have pretty much fallen out of favor and are disappearing rapidly. Um, so this technology has pretty much stepped in to fill the gap, but they haven't really changed NFPA 72 based on two-way devices yet. Um, there are lots of different devices out there that will do the same function that are produced by AES. The unit on the left here that you see is the old style, um, we call them legacy radios, the 7788F, F indicating it's a fire radio and that it's UL approved. Um, the middle radio is the one that we're seeing the most of now and it's the 7707 and that's the one we're gonna demo today. In the right hand side, there have been a few of these, but not many, the integrated um, 7706 panel. They're kind of limited. It's a bit like a 5104B when it comes to being a fire alarm panel, but it works. Um, the rules to install all of these units are essentially the same. They don't change. Um, come on. I'm working with a mouse that's not my normal mouse here, so I apologize if I'm jumping around a little bit. Both radios or all radios should be installed per the National Electric Code and NFPA requirements. You guys do that all day long. Um, it's nothing new. Everything has to be piped and it needs to be nice and permanent. There's several things that an inspector is going to look for and we're going to look at those one at a time as we get down through this presentation. Um, don't hesitate to pop a question in there if you need to uh, if you need to ask, I see one that's in there right now. Um, let me see if I can read it. As far south as Douglas County. Yes, it goes pretty much to the top of the Palmer Divide at County Line Road at the south end of Douglas County before it gets into um, El Paso County and Colorado Springs. It works fairly reliably anywhere from the top of Monument Hill all the way to the northern border of the state. Um, it's uh, got plenty of receivers throughout that whole area. Sub basements don't work very well with this gear. It's a lot like cellular. You can't use a radio below grade or in weak signal areas without putting in an outside antenna. Um, there is no magic solution to making an AES radio work. The best solution is an outside antenna if you're having any troubles or getting alarms that it's having a loss of central polling. We'll get a little deeper into that as we go down the road here, but essentially if you're having troubles getting signals to the central station or you cannot make the signal quality levels that are required, outside antennas are where you need to be. External antennas are a bit tricky um, they need to be installed very carefully and you have to use the proper cable and connectors. AES can supply those cables and connectors. Um, we generally keep a bunch of that stuff around here um, to do other, I mean, we've been radio guys for a lot of years in our group um, and AES is not a new thing for us. Um, but especially with the fact that these are not your normal everyday cables. They do not work the same way as coax for um, CCTV cameras. So you, the old style CCTV coax you cannot use on this system. They are uh, a different impedance, things work differently, and you will burn up the radio if you use the wrong cable or misinstall a cable. Um, all installs should be mechanically sound and inaccessible to walk up traffic. This is kind of a hot button for UL and for a lot of inspectors. 
Anytime you put in a system, it has to be piped. Um, anytime you put in an antenna, they want the antenna cable piped to the outside world so that nobody can get to the cable. They want it protected. It says it right in the install documents and the UL is really, really touchy about stuff like that. Um, so just make sure that when you're putting in this stuff, you're planning for conduit to the outside world if you need it. So as some of you may know, um, there have been a few problems that have popped up on multiple networks in Denver. And most of these problems come from incorrectly installed radios. And you're probably going, no, 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 that's not possible. It is very possible, and I'm going to explain as we go why it's possible. Runaway panels are the number one thing that we see every day. Um, we can see a panel generate 10,000 signals in one 24-hour period. This network is essentially one transmission path. So any panel that generates 10,000 signals in a day is going to cause other radios to not be able to report properly and therefore cause issues with trouble notifications to you guys. And you're sitting there asking, well, how is that possible? Well, when think of it this way, you have 20 kids sitting in a room and they're all screaming and yelling. You're trying to carry on a conversation with your significant other, what happens? Yes, you want to kill a couple of kids, but that's not going to fix it. It's essentially the same thing. With all of these folks talking at the same time, your radio can't get through. And a lot of that comes from runaways and too many signals coming from a device. Uh, the CMS dealer care guys will contact you if your panel starts to go into runaway, and it's a very serious thing when this happens. You may not think so, but you could take the whole network down with a runaway panel. And therefore, they're, they're getting very, very tough on runaway signals. The second thing is chronic low batteries. Right now in this system this morning, there was 59 low batteries out of 4,200 radios. Those 59, somebody raised their hand here. Hold on, let me see if I can see. Says Jessica raised her hand. If you can type the question and we'll get to it, Jessica. Uh, what do you do when a customer won't let you do a service call? <laughs> you figure out a way to do it. Um, we end up servicing a lot of these things gratis when this stuff happens. It's not our problem, but it becomes our problem because you put that radio in. CMS is starting to get very, very difficult on this kind of stuff. And it's, it's becoming very apparent that you're not going to be able to turn up another radio on the CMS network until that problem gets solved. And that's coming very, very quickly. So you need to figure out a way to solve those problems. Um, I know you guys want to be able to charge for it, but there's a responsibility associated with installing these radios. You need to take care of them. If you install a radio, you own that radio. <laughs> it's, it's yours from cradle to grave, whether you like it or not. Um, chronic low batteries are a serious, serious problem. We had a huge power outage here earlier in the year in Denver, and we lost something like 250,000 uh, customers in the Denver metro area were without power. There were about 500 radios in the Denver network that were without power. Of those 500 radios, almost 50 of them had low batteries. When that battery is low and the power goes off, all of a sudden you have lost a significant portion of your network. There are no longer multiple paths to the central station when radios get shut down because of low batteries. They don't shut themselves off, but when the commercial power is gone, they can no longer operate. 
those 56 radios are a significant detriment to the network. And it's all because of things like Jessica mentioned that a customer won't let you do a service call. It's a low battery. They have to replace batteries in their systems on a regular basis, at least every two years. These low batteries have been going on now for at least 10 years. And it, it tells me that the dealer that installed these radios is not paying attention to the big picture. You guys need to make sure you look at this stuff when it's out there. And especially when CMS starts calling, telling you that there are low battery issues, they need to get dealt with. Um, that, that is the number one cause of massive problems in the network in Denver. And then you guys start calling saying that your network is down, your network is down. Well, it's only down because the dealer didn't take care of a low battery. You put a, a new battery in these radios, they work just fine and they will work until the battery goes low again. Always remember, batteries are a critical issue. Runaway pan panels are a critical issue. Pay attention to those things. Another thing that we see all the time is a message that comes up on the central station uh, receivers uh, called uh, loss of central polling. You guys will see that and it'll pop up quite a bit. Loss of central polling is an indication that you are losing your path to the central station. When you lose your path to the central station, the best way to solve that is more antenna or outside antennas. There is almost nowhere in the Denver metro area that you can go that really needs an outside antenna unless you're inside of a really, really deep concrete building. In those cases, you have to figure out a way to get an antenna outside. And because they will not let you relocate the, the subscriber radio other than within the, the location of where the panel is, you're gonna have to figure out how to run cable. AES can supply you with all the pieces necessary to do that. Here's another thing that we find all the time that's kind of caused by weak signal and not enough antenna and all of the above problems when things happen. There is a, a, an output on the radio called J4. J4 is supposed to be connected to your fire alarm control panel and it's supposed to report that the AES radio has trouble communicating with the network or you've lost AC power or you have a low battery. It's supposed to send a trouble signal. In a lot of cases, the installers will take the J4 output and they will send it to a communicating zone. And when I mean a communicating zone, that zone will transmit a signal to the central station if it trips. J4 is intended to be a local only alarm. And we're going to talk about that a little further as we go. These are the four things that have caused all of the headaches in the network over the last 20 years. And you guys need to be aware of them. And because you're the installers, you're the ones that need to be taking care of these things. Most of the information that we're going to give you here um, is stuff that you're going to need to know may not be intuitive and it's very common mistakes. There are also things that are very special to installing AES radios. We're not here to tell you today how your zones are configured or how fire alarms are installed, only how to properly install AES. So if you have a question associated with a fire alarm, I can try to answer it, but I'm not a fire alarm installer. I don't compete with you guys. I'm in the burglar alarm business I built the Denver network for Monotol, now CMS, and I maintain the network for CMS. But I don't compete with you guys. I just know how this stuff works. All right, so J4 on most radios, this picture is from a 7788, but in the 7707, it's in the lower left-hand corner of the board. It's all the same. It's called J4 everywhere. And it just happens to be in this picture because I've, I've grabbed this picture from somewhere else and we're gonna use it today. 
Uh, the J4 antenna comm trouble output should be supervised locally by the alarm system on a zone. This will allow you to send trouble signals to the fire alarm panel that can't be heard from the front of the AES radio. Sometimes the AES radios will be installed in a location that people will hear it. Sometimes it'll be installed in a fire alarm, fire alarm control panel room that nobody will hear. In this case, you wanna make sure that when it transmits to that zone, it's gonna generate trouble only at the control point for the fire alarm system or at, at the door of the AES radio if it can be heard. It's so somebody will hear it and know that there's a problem. When you hook this up to the AES radio, if there's a problem in the network, and it's transmitting that signal to the central station, every time that signal transmits, it's going to hold that signal if it can't get to the central station. This is only in a case of trouble. So when it holds that signal, it will generate another fail to communicate signal once that signal can't get to the central station and it generates another trouble. So J4 will start stacking up alarms in the AES radio. If it does this for a period of time, it could be thousands upon thousands of signals. Once that radio returns back to normal communication, it will send those thousands of signals all in one fell swoop. You can kind of see that there is a problem when it starts to dump all of those signals back on the network. That is a massive problem for the network. AES has an application note on J4. Part of the documentation that was sent out to you is that J4 information. Um, I would familiarize yourself with that. Make sure that you spend a little time on it and actually understand it. I can open it up here for you guys and you can look at it. Um, stand by, let me get it open. is a little harder to do remotely because normally this would just be laying in your on your desk when you came into the meeting. Maybe next year. Okay, it's opening on my screen and I'll share it here in just a moment. Computers are slow when you have them doing all of this stuff. Still opening. I think it's time for a new computer. Okay. Okay, so this document right here that you have in your packet that was sent out to you is clear information directly from AES. This is on their website if you ever need it. This is not something, uh, so D uh, Dane has a question here. He says, can the J4 output also used as a Form C relay to control another audible alarm? So the AES radio has an audible alarm on the front panel. Um, most AHJs ask that it be a zone on the fire alarm panel because it's easier to manage. It can go to another alarm, but it's really gonna depend on what your AHJ tells you. Um, that's a tough situation. Um, they make a remote enunciator for some of the AES radios and Denver was reluctant to allow those. Um, it really depends on what you submit to the AHJ and what they'll, what they'll let you do. Uh, that's gonna be a case by case basis uh, because I, I don't normally do anything with fire alarms. So that's a really tough situation for me to be able to answer. Somebody else out there may be able to answer it, but I'm guessing that 
they will let you do it to another audible device, but most jurisdictions now want to see it as a non-transmitting zone on the fire alarm. Uh, this documentation is not something that we really need to go down through, but I would spend a couple of minutes when you're having a hard time sleeping at night and read this, spend a little bit of time on it and learn a little bit about J4. But this is information that was passed directly from AES and not something that was generated by us. Um, and most of the information that you're going to see here today has come directly from AES. All right, get back to a new share here. I'll get back to the presentation. I think we've beat that one to death. Let's uh, move on down the road here a little bit. Okay. So now with the J4 trouble alarm, when you go to do an inspection, in a lot of cases, your inspector is going to want to confirm that it's a local only alarm. And we're going to tell you today how to simulate the local only alarm on an AES radio or how to simulate an alarm so you can test it. So I'm going to switch to another camera that I've got over here and see if I can show you this. All right. So here on the left side of an AES radio, you'll see this silver box. This is actually the radio. That radio is the device that transmits the alarm over the radio. The board in the bottom is basically just the computer that's talking to that radio. So at the bottom of that box, there is a connector that you can remove. It's a gray connector and it looks just like a serial port connector or a video connector on your computer. And there is a couple of thumb screws at the side over here that you can take loose. In fact, let me just grab another radio. It's easier than me trying to take that out. All right. This radio has this cable on it. That cable goes into the bottom of the radio. If you disconnect this cable, which is the only cable of its kind on an AES radio, if you disconnect it, the alarm signal takes about 10 minutes to trip when it's not talking to the central station. That 10 minutes seems like an eternity. But once it trips and it starts sending the information to the display and starts beeping and the yellow LED comes on, um, that information is populated as a either a failure to communicate or an antenna cut or something on the display of the radio. And the display of the radio is in my little in my little demo here, which I'll show you. Okay, so over here on the right hand side, this is, this is the display that's normally in the door of the radio. I took it out so it would make it a little easier for me to show you what it is, but it'll tell you exactly what's going on there. Um, once you get the beeping and an alarm indication there, go check with the central station. If they get any signal, then once you plug, or I should say, once you plug the radio back in after that, it's going to, it will probably transmit sub, some signal. It should only be a reset or a timer test. It should not send any zone alarm from your radio. That zone alarm from the radio is an indication that it's not a local only alarm. 
This is always a, a concern for some people because they say that sometimes their panels don't transmit, are not allowed to not transmit an alarm in the case of a fire, that it should be local only. And I think, I think that that is a manufacturer situation. Um, I know that most of the panels that I've seen are local only in some cases and other cases your mileage may vary. That's one of the situations that we'll have to deal with when it gets there. And I think that'll probably go back to Dane's comment about making it go to another, um, another audible alarm. That's gonna be something you're gonna have to discuss with your, uh, your inspector or with whoever did your plan review before you go in for your permit because they can definitely they can definitely work with this and help you solve the situation. But this also goes back to the people that draw your drawings. You need to school them up on how this works also. Case by case basis in most. Um, Denver, they keep waffling on this. They will allow the remote enunciator sometimes. They will allow the enunciator on the panel door as long as they're within uh, an area where people can hear it. But remotely, yeah, that's going to be a tough one. You're going to have to work that one out. I'm not really here to tell you how to permit it, but other than you have to figure out how to do it that works with their uses. IntelliTaps. So an IntelliTap or an IntelliPro is what AES uses to transmit full signals from the dialer in your alarm panel to the AES radio. It tricks the panel into thinking it's got dial tone and voltage and call procedural signals. It's a very good device. It takes a little bit, just like on a phone line, to capture the information from your panel but once that information gets out of the IntelliTap, it only takes just a second for that information to get to the central station. They're fantastic devices. They allow you to connect pretty much to anything. Um, an IntelliTap or an IntelliPro, they basically, and I know they're working on this, so at some point they may actually get um, another type of transmission method currently only transmit 4-2 and contact ID. It currently doesn't do SIA, but I think they've been working on it um, because it's contact ID currently, it only does 999 points in zones. So you'll have to figure out how to squeeze your panel down to report on 999 points in zones. We've had some people that have come to us and said, well, it's not working. Well, what format are you transmitting? Uh, see ya. Well, it doesn't do see ya, but I think they're working on it. Um, I have a brand new IntelliTap in this radio next to me, and it has an option for um, something that it doesn't specifically say see ya. It says data, but I'm going to have to test that and see if it actually works yet. It may or may not. Your mileage may vary with these guys, um, but I think it's coming. Another note that I've been bit by at least three times in the last month that you guys need to know about because your fire alarm panel plugs into the IntelliTap. The IntelliTap converts the data that comes from the fire alarm panel and sends it through the AES radio. Out of the box, it doesn't touch the data coming from the fire alarm. It doesn't change the account number. It doesn't change the phone numbers that it's dialing. So you have to set your fire alarm panel to dial 555, which is out of the box, the way an AES IntelliTap works. The phone number it's expecting is 555. And it's expecting the account number to come from the panel to transmit to the central station. Now, 
you'll notice that if you don't change that information in the fire alarm panel, whatever data was there, you're gonna step on that account. So say your account number is 9999 that you're supposed to be transmitting on and your fire alarm panel was set to 0251. The IntelliTap is gonna grab that 0251 and send that alarm to the network. That alarm coming from the network is gonna get reported to the central station and there's gonna be an alarm on 0251. Guess what? 0251 is not your account number. So if you set a fire alarm signal, you just rolled a truck on 0251. And you're gonna make somebody really, really unhappy because they're gonna to have to go figure out what happened. And then it's gonna come back and that finger is gonna point directly back at you. Um, it sends that exactly the way it's programmed unless you go into the AES programming, which we'll show you a little later, and have it overwrite that information and use the AES account number. If you do not have the ability to program that in the fire alarm panel, you can overwrite it with the IntelliTap, but this is not the default setting for the AES at least three times a month i've had this happen from somebody misprogramming an aes and not masking the fire alarm account number and rolling a truck on one of our accounts not a good thing remember with great power comes great responsibility and you have it in this case All right, so this is one of the things that's near and dear to my heart, external antennas. External antennas definitely are a requirement in some cases. Weak signals that are coming from your subscriber units cause massive problems with the network because of paths that change all the time because they're right on the ragged edge of being able to work make sure that your subscriber has plenty of paths to the central station. Pardon me, <coughs> too much talking. If you have three, four or five paths to the central station, that's good. You probably have enough antenna. If you have two paths to the central station and that's all you see, I would highly recommend getting some more antenna on any radio. You'll start getting notifications from the central station which come in as an E356 loss of central polling. That's kind of a dead giveaway. If you start getting these alarms, there's no fault on anybody except the fact that when it was installed, there wasn't enough antenna put on the unit. Get some more outside antenna and get comfortable with installing the things. You'll be very happy that you did. And so will your customers because you're not gonna have to go back and fix all of these things. And yes, if you have loss of central polling, you're responsible for going to fix this stuff if you didn't do it right on the front end. External antennas are UL approved and absolutely encouraged. There's no restriction on the size or type of the antenna. Even a small antenna outside is better than no antenna outside. They have to be installed with a, in accordance with the National Electric Code and Building Code. Grounding, all the cables have to be encased in conduit if they can be reached from ground level or anybody can touch them. Anytime you install a two and a half DBA is not allowed outside in Denver, um, I beg to differ. You're talking about the, it, there's no restriction on the size of the antenna. If you're talking about the antenna that comes with the unit, the rubber duck is not allowed outside. That is absolutely correct. But when you're specifically saying two and a half dB is not allowed outside, allowed outside in Denver, I have two and a half dB antennas all over Denver and they're perfectly legal, but it's not the rubber duck. It is a real, antenna that is designed to be mounted outside. 
Um, there, there is no UL restriction on the type or size of antenna. They only want you to make sure that you install a proper base station antenna on your device. A rubber duck is not a base station antenna. It's meant to go inside. It's not, it's not weatherproof and it's really not designed to be out in the elements. It's going to get broken. And in the steps that we go through here in a couple more slides, I'll show you some pictures and some model numbers of the AES antennas. They want you, anytime you install an antenna, to put a surge suppressor and grounded on the antenna. Here's the part number for AES's surge suppressor. Uh, AES, it's part number 52-0054 or similar. Um, I like to use a company called um, oh, geez, I can't even think of it. Um, polyphaser. I generally use polyphaser. I came from the cellular industry and most everything in the cellular world is done with polyphasers. And AES provides their own. It's a lot cheaper than the polyphaser. So I know that you guys are always price sensitive on this kind of stuff and you're trying to make a few dollars. So use the AES part. It's just fine. It works well. Like I said, exterior and publicly accessible coaxes to the antenna have to be protected in conduit. <clears throat> it's also in the 7707F. Um, there's an addendum that goes with it. It's not in the original manual, but it's in the addendum. Um, always use the straightest and shortest, most direct routing possible on any coax installation. Anytime you install a piece of coax, what I would suggest is you cut the cable to the proper length. If you have a roll of cable somewhere in the area, it's not installed properly. You definitely need to use the proper size. If any of you guys do cable TV, uh, the CATV coax that uh, is readily available in most cases. I've seen this on a few installers where they've used CATV coax because the, the BNC connectors fit perfectly on the end of the coax. It's not 50 ohms, you're gonna burn up your radio. You have to use 50 ohm cable. And there's a note from Dane, it says, all be careful that the grounding of the polyphaser does not have to, let's, let me read this again. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're trying to say. Grounding on a polyphaser has to be a typical ground, which is water pipe, structural steel, or something. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're trying to get to there, Dane. What we generally do in most cases is we use a good electrical ground, another ground rod, structural steel, or good... Um, green wire ground coming from some good ground point. And you know what good ground points are, water pipes. And I know that water pipes are a little bit nebulous anymore because um, there's a lot of PEX that's being run in buildings and that gets to be very, very difficult. It has to be a good electrical ground. And I can tell you from experience that without a good ground, things get blown up. All right. so. This is essentially a two and a half dB gain antenna. Um, AES sells it, it's called a 7210-3-UM. It's the same gain as the antenna that comes on the box, but the base is designed to be mounted for outside. They also make the five dB Omni, which also has the base station adapter kit. You guys should have received this presentation in your email. So if you wanna go back and refer to this and figure out what you need to purchase, it's all right here. They make a higher gain one, and this is about an inch in diameter. Um, these are what I prefer to use in most cases. It's a 6 dB outside. It's made out of fiberglass. It's about five feet, eh, four and a half feet long, made out of white fiberglass with an aluminum base. Very stout, not really great for mountaintops, but for in the city, it's great. 
They also make a 9 dB version. If you're really out in the sticks on the fringe, um, the 9 dB is good, but they get much, much thinner as you get to the top of the antenna and they don't deal with high winds very well. They don't deal with icing and they tend to break off and it looks like somebody shot a banana with a shotgun when they break. They're, they're pretty light duty for that. Okay, so when you install a fire system, most of you guys are purchasing the radios that are designed for UL. They do make burglar radios that essentially work the same way and they will do the same thing. Okay, here's Dane's comment. Direct current is an essential part of the antenna part of working. Uh, using other than AES grounding components can cause issues during install. Yes, antennas are DC grounded. You have to use a polyphaser or surge suppressor that allows for a direct DC ground. Um, you definitely need to make sure that you're using the proper components. Using AES's components will definitely keep you out of trouble with that. DC grounded antennas are another thing that can really, really make your life hell. Um, static of any kind will get brought in on the shield of an antenna if it's not DC grounded and it will blow your radio up. So everything needs to be grounded extremely well. Um, and as long as it's pretty much the same potential as the radio, you're usually okay. So you guys are buying radios that are UL listed for fire. The picture that you see on the screen here with the model type 7707 fire is essentially, I'm looking here, can you discuss the phantom antenna that mounts on the radio a little bit? It seems that AES is, always says to try that first. Okay, I will do that. Um, the antenna, which is, we call it a rubber duck that comes on the radio itself. Let me see if I got one laying here. Uh, I don't remember what I did with it. It is a two and a half dB antenna. And what they're telling you to do is try it on the box first. Most places in Denver, it's going to work okay on the box on top of the AES radio, wherever you mount it. Now, wherever you mount that radio, the signals can change in the length of that antenna. So if you're having trouble in one location, move it the length of the antenna, either up, down, side, side, wherever it happens to be. That is a 5 8 wavelength antenna. If you go more than a half a wavelength away from wherever you were, you may be out of a null on your signal and it may work better. So try positioning the radio before you permanently mount that radio to know that it's going to work there. They do not want you to use that antenna in an outside location. It, it cannot stand up to the elements. It's not designed for it it will break. But test it first with the antenna that's on the box. What I'm telling you is worst case situation putting an antenna on to try to solve the communications issue. That's where we get into trouble. I'm trying to tell you where the pitfalls are and not really how to do normal things. I would recommend always trying the radio first and uh, you will very likely have good results from it. My unit that you see here in this picture is laying on the desk, it's sideways. Um, and I'll show you the picture here. It's sideways on my desk, laying on the top. Here's the rubber duck antenna. And as we go into programming, you're going to see that it's got like five paths to the central station. And that's, that's pretty typically what you're gonna see in most cases. The antenna should be vertical and it should be mounted on the box. If it's not mounted on the box, then you have to go to alternate plan B. Um, 
Alternate plan B is where you get into trouble and where you need external antennas. And there is always a situation that there's a learning curve associated with installing those antennas. Um, I've always wanted to do a live uh, connector slash coax slash antenna class. And uh, if there's some interest in that, uh, drop me a note and let me know. Uh, John M at csalarm.com. And I believe that that's at the end of the presentation too. Um, the screenshot on this radio is basically to indicate that it is a fire rated radio. This fire rated radio, most of the older style radios will end in an F if it's a fire UL listed radio. And there have been some AHJs that have had concerns about making sure that it's a fire rated radio. It's pretty easy to tell on the new ones because it spells it out. Okay, so we're going to go into AES's multi path slash mesh concept here a little bit so that you're going to understand what netcon means and what link layer means. It seems to be a nebulous thing and it's confusing to some people. So I'm going to spend a few minutes and go over that and show you a little bit about this that should make the light bulb come on a lot brighter. Um, come on, there we go. All fire alarm installations require two paths to the central station that can be validated on the AES with a netcon reading of five. To validate that an AES subscriber unit has multiple paths of communications available, you have to connect to your fire radio with a Wi-Fi dongle, or in the case of the 7707, you can actually see it on the front display now. And I can easily pop that up here and show you. I spent all this time trying to do this, so. I might as well show you exactly what it's doing. All right, right here on this display, you're gonna see it says, let me make my window bigger because I can't see it either. Seven seven oh seven fire, status normal. And if you push the button once, it's gonna get really, really bright. Third push, as soon as this display goes out, you should be able to see it. It says link layer one, netcon five. That's right straight from the front panel of the radio. Um, the front panel of the radio is an easy thing because you don't need to do anything special for it. But uh, one of the things that we're gonna do here is we're gonna use the Wi-Fi dongle here, which if you guys don't have these, you should have one of these in your kit for sure, available from AES. I won't say that I've bought these off of Amazon and they're about uh, eight bucks, but it's a Panda Wireless PAU04. And these are the ones that uh, AES sells, they work very well. But you take this, this dongle and you plug it into the USB port on the radio in the corner. as I figure out how to do it. And then I can't really show it on my cell phone because I'm using my cell phone to show you this display. You're going to look for a Wi-Fi SSID that's gonna pop up and it's gonna be AES in like six digits. And the last four digits of your um, SSID will be listed on a sticker on the back of the AES radio. It's usually over, over here. There's a, there's a sticker right there that has that SSID on it. If you look for that SSID and it starts with AES, right here it's going to show you AES 2.0218 and it shows right on the bottom of the display. So you're going to connect your Wi-Fi on your phone to that network. It's going to ask you for a password, and you're going to punch in 7707 fire as the password for that network.
once you get connected, it's going to pop up a window and that window is going to show you, let me find it here, share. All right, I believe I am showing my screen for this radio. It's going to show you this in a pop-up window. You do not need to open your browser. You don't need to do anything tricky. It's just going to pop this window up. When it brings you to the login page, admin and admin will get you in. It'll bring you to the main screen. This radio has already been programmed, um, but I haven't put a subscriber unit in so that we can do that here today. The main screen that you're going to see is going to show you link layer and netcon. The only thing that the inspector is ever going to worry about is really netcon and the number of paths you have to the central station. On this list, it's shown as routes. Routes are very important in their mind. So right now, I have the first path to 9AED. 9AED is a, it's, it's the original infrastructure that was built in Denver to carry traffic. That 9AED is what the network uses as its backbone in order to be able to communicate with all of the radios. They are called IP links. That is not to be confused with um, hybrid subscriber units. These are very different. Hybrid subscriber units looks exactly like a regular subscriber unit with the exception of a couple of added pieces of hardware. All of the paths that you have to the central station will be enumerated in the routes list. That routes list theoretically should be more than two. And it will always tell you which paths are good and which paths are marginal. I have three paths to the central station. And that three paths to the central station are through two subscriber units and one IP link. You can tell the IP links because there's a number in the, the three letters AED behind it. You'll see 0 AED, 1 AED, 2 AED, 3 AED, 4, 5, <clears throat> 7, 8, and 9 right now. 6 is not out in the network, but there are 9 IP links up and down the front range and various hybrid subscribers out there too, which we'll get into a little bit, and they can cause extreme problems if they're not set up properly. So under configuration, come on, this is where you do the nuts and bolts of the system. The subscriber ID is right here at the top. They come out of the box as E E E E. And we're going to change it to another test account so that we're not stomping on anybody here today of 9999. Click the box inside of this area. If you click any other box, like down here, it will not save your changes from above. Each of these save changes is for the specific area that you're working on. It has become a concern from some people that it wasn't taking configuration changes because um, they didn't click in the box. They thought just clicking on the save button down here at the bottom was enough to do it. Cipher code right here, don't touch it. If you touch that cipher code, refresh the page. Just start over, go back to where you were, go to configuration, and make any changes you feel necessary and move down the line. Now down here to the flexible power option, this is another interesting configuration that I like, but Denver won't let you do. You can, wow, that was nice. Um, 
you can power this from 24 volts from a panel, but in city and county of Denver, they really won't let you do that. So you definitely have to make sure that your AHJ will let you do it. In most cases, Denver want you to put a 16 and a half volt transformer in the AES radio with a battery. That's pretty much critical. Um, they don't want it to, um, they don't want it to be powered from the panel. They want it separate so it's standalone and it can report a failure. I think they consider it belts and suspenders so that if there's a problem in the panel, it's still going to report that there's problem. You can do it on 12 volts only. You can do it on 24 volts with the battery, 24 volts without the battery, and 16 and a half volts with the adapter and the battery. In the case of what we've got running here, it's 16 and a half volts in a battery. And this radio, brand new out of the box, started the charger fault this morning. So I had to suppress the charger fault so this thing wasn't going to beep through the whole meeting. But normally this would not be checked. Uh, down here at the bottom is, they call it advanced configuration. And on the new style radios, you really shouldn't have to touch the time to lives. On the older radios, you will need to touch time to live. And in the documentation that we supplied you, there is a, um, it's called AES radio time to live document, which spells out these exact time to lives that they want you to use on older style radios because they used to be infinite. Um, infinite time to live is a bad idea because any signal that uh, gets captured by the radio would be remembered forever until it got transmitted to the central station. So if the network has a problem and the signals get backlogged, then you need to make sure that those signals drop off after a certain period of time. In this case, uh, time to live on an alarm is three hours. So if the network didn't come back in three hours, it's going to throw away that alarm. And in three hours, the building is probably burned to the ground, but then the whole network didn't burn to the ground. Um, the subscriber IP address down here at the bottom is if you're using this device as a hybrid type subscriber, which generally costs more than a regular radio, you would choose radio and internet backup here or internet and radio backup. Um, we like the radio and internet backup in most cases, and I'm not sure how the AHJs are gonna react to that, but having two, two transmit paths is a really nice thing. But this down here at the bottom indicates that it should grab a network address from the customer's network automatically when you plug it in. Uh, that's pretty much the main configuration for these devices. Um, this unit here, if you'll notice down at the bottom of the status page under hardware, it's showing you everything about the radio and see right here where it says panel interface. It says it detected an IntelliPro. So there's an IntelliPro plugged into this radio. This is a Virgin radio. It's straight out of the box. Um, I got it this week from AES. And it's asking you down here, system hardware change detected. Click accept or reconfigure your hardware. So you have to click this button right here to enroll that hardware into your radio. When you enroll that hardware, it's going to boot the radio. It's thinking about it. They're, one of the things that you'll notice about these radios is they're extraordinarily slow. Um, trying to deal with these radios is somewhat frustrating um, because they take so long to do everything. Any change you make up here on this top row, there's gonna be a red update button that's going to appear. I'm gonna click update. For any of the changes that we made, you hear it complaining over here. 
That's fun. Every time this radio goes into transmit, it kills the video on my camera. Another lesson learned. Okay, I'm back, hopefully. So right now you're seeing that it's showing initializing right here and you're starting to see the paths show up on the system. You still see a netcon of seven and this display refreshes itself automatically. And it's showing now a netcon of six. It's still thinking about it. And it can take a couple of minutes for it to find all of the, the paths to the central station after a reset. Still showing a netcon of six, but we know that it had a netcon of five before after sitting here for a while. And it's showing six paths. Um, two through six are marginal. And it's it's going to sit here and basically just chug until it finds its its additional paths to the central station. Um, the netcon that you see on the screen here is uh, essentially network connectivity level. Seven indicates there's no path to the central station. Six, that it says it has established one solid route to the central station. And the way this works is other subscriber units need to talk for this thing to find the route to the central station. So it could take a little bit for, and I'm not exactly in the middle of town. I'm uh, up on a mountain in Evergreen. So it's quite a ways to the nearest uh, other subscribers. And you just have to, you have to be patient with it sometimes. It'll get there um, on this radio, but with yours in town, it should be fairly quick that it'll figure out a path to the central station. Now, let me go back to um, my little drawing here. Go back over to my other share. Okay, back to the presentation here. So the first box that you'll see is a subscriber that is four hops away from an IP link. The IP links in Denver, it's only showing two here. In Denver, there's 10. So if you're one hop away from the central station receiver, it's called link layer of one. Um, if you're two hops away, it's called a link layer of two and so on and so on. If your subscriber unit only has one path to the central station, it's gonna be considered a netcon of six. And you remember that uh, the radio that I was showing you as an, as an example here was showing a netcon of six. Let me go back to my share over here. And I'll bring up the radio. This is normally done by you. Makes it a little easier for you to see it direct. But now on this radio, it's showing a link layer of one that is a single hop to the central station and a net count of five. And you're seeing down here 9 AED is one hop away. It's showing a link layer of zero. 4165 is showing a link layer of one. So it's one hop away. And then the link layer of two with these marginals from here are, are two hops away. Link layer of zero is essentially connected directly to um, a central station receiver. But you kind of get the idea here, what that's telling you when you're looking at it. It doesn't mean anything except for the number of hops when you're talking about link layer. Don't worry too much about the nuts and bolts of it. 
Netcon of five is what you're concerned about. If you see a Netcon of six, it's going to flag it as red in the radio. And it's not going to be happy about that, and neither is your AHJ. If all of your paths are showing as, as green and your Netcon is showing as five, that's all he really needs to worry about. So I say handheld programmer here. Uh, handheld programmer is also this device that I showed you earlier with your mobile, your handheld, your computer, whatever it happens to be. You're not stuck using a computer here. Your, your handheld device works perfectly on this. We use it all the time. Level on the programmer or link layer on the radio on the, the web page that you use to program the 2.0s are the same. If you guys have programmed 1.0 radios, the terminology is slightly different, but it all comes out the same. Netcon is the same in both places, network connectivity level, and that's what we just showed you. Routes is another thing that AHJs will sometimes ask you. They want to make sure that you have two or more paths to the central station. I would encourage you to try to get enough antenna on your radio to get uh, at least a couple more paths added on there because what happens if you lose one of those other radios, either the subscriber cancels or the power is off, it's going to force you to go a different route. These radios are smart enough to know that if there are problems with the radio, bad batteries, uh, AC failures, or any of that kind of uh, trouble on the radio, it will force the subscriber units to go around it to get to the central station because it's a not a reliable path. All radios will collect a list of radios that they can hear. And it quantizes those as good or marginal as to whether they work well. At least two good paths are required, but I have found that in the cases of power outages and other things, it's probably a good idea to have more than that at least a few more paths that it can talk to. And that sometimes comes back to adding an outside antenna. So we went through this list. We showed the, the other stuff that uh, uh, the radio can see uh, with the one through eight. And you'll notice that this is dynamic. The list that uh, we were looking at before is different than this list now. In fact, I don't see any of the same except for nine. Um, the screenshots on the 2.0 radio that we're going to show you here um, are essentially how to program your radio. Um, but I'm going to go back here and I'm going to walk you through what things should be changed and what things shouldn't be changed on your radio. And I'm doing this from a computer because I can't figure out how to get my phone to do a screen capture. So the display is a little smaller, but the information is all still exactly the same. Status is just that. It shows you the first page when you log in with all of this information about the radio. You scroll down to the bottom now, panel interface is no longer showing red and there's no more adopt button down here. Configuration is where you're gonna do most of your stuff that needs to be done. Subscriber ID, don't change the check-in interval, leave it at 23 hours and 45 minutes. This is something that you need to understand. This is not 11.45 p.m. This is 23 hours and 45 minutes from the time the radio booted. So say you boot the radio at nine in the morning, it's going to check in at 8.45 the next day. The next day after that, it's going to check in at 8.30. The next day after that, it's going to check in at 8.15. It's going to check in at a different time every day by doing that so that it's not always sending signals at exactly the same time. This is in an effort to try to slow down the signals that come through the network 
and swamp the receivers. There's only a finite number of receivers and this is a very slow data channel. It is a 1200 baud data channel. You can only fit so much data through that. This is 1980s computer technology here. We're not talking internet speeds. So just be aware that every signal that comes through the network is a major concern. All right, the next tab is accessories. And this is one that you'll uh, get to know very well. The first portion of it is the zones that are on board in the unit. If you look at an AES radio board, the bottom terminals on the AES radio board, there are, there are eight zones that have resistors on them. The, the units come with the resistors and you just have to install them on these, these zones. I would recommend in most cases, put a resistor on it, whether you're using it or not. One of the things that we've learned, when AES radios boot, they sometimes false and send signals on those ports, even if it shows as bypassed, as you see in this list. So I make it a habit to just put those on there. Don't, don't pass go until you put the resistors on the zones. Yes, it's an extra step and yes, it's kind of a pain in the butt, but shortcutting things will stop truck rolls and anything you can do to stop rolling a fire truck is a good thing. Down here below it is the configuration for the IntelliPro. This is something that I spoke about earlier and you definitely need to understand. <clears throat> So if you had a phone line connected to this in addition to, in this case, probably no phone line. They're trying to get rid of phone lines. You can turn it on, you can turn it off, but we leave phone lines out of the, the mix in most cases. So the alarm panel report format, contact ID, modem, and pulse. This is the one that they're working on right now. I believe this is going to be SIA. I have not been able to get it to work. Your mileage may vary. It may have changed something since I used this the last time, but I have not been able to make it work. Contact ID and pulse, which is 4-2, works great. If you're having problems with the alarm panel talking to the IntelliTap, you can turn the gain up or down with a setting right here on this. Intercept on blind dial, it grabs the phone line as soon as it comes off hook. It doesn't care what is being sent from the alarm panel. It's going to grab that line and it's going to take the data from that information directly. Here's another one that we use all the time and that you guys should be very familiar with also, which is alarm panel account override. If you cannot figure out how to change your alarm panel to send 555 with the proper alarm account number, turn this on. It will take whatever comes in from the alarm panel and stick its account number, in this radio's case, 9999 in there. It's kind of necessary in some cases to do this, or you're going to be rolling trucks on accounts that could be anywhere from the north border to Monument Peak or uh, Monument Hill on the front range if you duplicate their account number. Like I said, it happens about three times a month to me with a new guy turning up an IntelliTap, forgot to program the panel to send 555 and the correct account number. Advanced options allows you to do a couple of things. AP output gain. So if your alarm panel is not hearing the kiss off, you can turn this gain up to allow the alarm panel to have more signal so it can deal with that kiss off not getting through. Sometimes that happens, sometimes that doesn't. But this allows you to change that. There is a question here. Uh, what's with the new blue and yellow resistors? I have no idea. They send 2x the number of resistors that they need to send. I think the people that are doing the packing are just not paying attention. 
because I set this one up today. And here's what I had left over, the exact amount of resistors I needed to do it again. But there's no difference in the value whatsoever. One side is white, one side is blue. I can't tell the difference. They're both 2.2K and they both work just fine. So <laughs> I don't know what they're doing, but they're definitely throwing extra hardware in there. Um, I am not sure what CID 4XX letter is. I've never needed to change this. If you guys know what that means, you'll probably know what to change there. Voltage pump. So on the phone line that the AES uses, it sends power to the alarm panel. Leave this as default, don't mess with it. It's very advanced stuff. Phone lines are tricky, don't change it. The stuff that you're gonna to wanna to change is the AP output gain if you have a problem and account number override. We use that all the time. And intercept on blind dial will basically answer any phone number coming down the line. So if you're sending 1877-240-0364 from the alarm panel, if you do the intercept on blind dial, it will grab on whatever number comes down the line. Um, this RFIP tap ACK that you see down here at the bottom, clock frequency shift is not something that we change either. Um, the, the tap ACK is not something that CMS is set up to handle yet. Um, the acknowledgement comes from the central station. That acknowledgement comes through in the original packet from the AES radio it does not come from the central station, but it will continue to try to send until it gets the acknowledgement from the radio. So this is something that's not configured yet, not something that we'll use, so don't even, don't even go there yet. Under the system tab, this is where you can change the password on the radio. I don't suggest changing passwords on life safety devices. Um, you can add new users. Um, and then here is some options. There is a beeper that's on the door that can drive people crazy. I have one here at my house that's on my alarm panel. And once in a while, the thing will start beeping and my significant other goes crazy. And that beeper is, is disabled on mine. I use a red radio for a Berg system at my house. In that case, turn it off. In most life safety situations, I would not recommend turning it off. LCD status, you can turn that off if you want so that uh, you don't have people poking at it. It's purely up to you. Um, you can, if you're changing from one radio to another, download the settings from this unit and put them on your computer and then upload them to a new subscriber unit in the box below so that you didn't have to do all the reconfiguration. If you have a radio that you wanna use somewhere else or you're making a big change, you can subscriber config, uh, you can reset it. You can also set the IntelliTap to default. Another thing that we've been doing recently is, this is a 7.200 radio and AES pushes firmware updates on their website and you can easily update the firmware on a radio if you need new features through this right straight from this page. Um, you can reboot the radio from here. Another thing that, that makes this nice is if you're able to connect to this radio over the internet, you can do a lot of configuration from here. Um, most of the network that we have out there um, the, the backbone infrastructure is all connected over the internet and we can do a lot of functions remotely. So under tools, there's some good information here. If you wanted to look at um, the alarms that this unit has sent, it will show up in this alarm history window. And this is kind of neat too, because this is something you can't easily do in some of the other radios. You can look at all of the radios and what traffic is coming in on the network. And this is real time. This, this information is up to the minute. This is exactly what is coming in from this radio and what else is happening out on the network. What you're seeing here is 
9 AED, which is one of the AES radios that's not very far from here. And you're seeing a lot of traffic coming from that radio, radio getting acknowledged. But if you're wondering what's going on, this is a good way to be able to tell what your radio is doing and how it is handshaking with the network. Now this here, this is somewhat advanced. If, if you're not familiar with radio equipment, I would kind of ignore this. RF antenna test allows you to turn the transmitter on on the radio with a watt meter in line, which is not something that uh, most fire guys keep in their truck, to be able to test the antenna with live power. If you don't know what it is, don't touch it. If you want to be able to confirm communications on your device, there's also a ping here, which will allow you to ping over the internet. This is not a radio ping, this is over the internet. Now your radio can be pinged remotely from dealer care if you contact them and you want them to send a ping to your radio to see if it's actually there. Uh, but that's somewhat advanced and you may have a hard time getting to the right person to help you do that. Let me go back up to the top. Statistics here will tell you information about the channel and the signals that it is seeing out there. So the blue line that you see that's all the way across the bottom is transmit. The red line is how much it's hearing on receive and part of the channel, it's seeing, seeing the channel peak about 9% of channel utilization, which is very good. This information is very helpful if you're trying to, to troubleshoot things. Also with battery voltage, shows you that it's at 14 volts. Primary voltage, this is coming in from the 16.8 transformer and both primary and battery voltage on the same graph. This information can be very helpful in troubleshooting and the, the AES 2.0 radios have come a long way. Um, they really have tried to give us tools that we haven't been able to have as uh, normal installers and that comes at a price in some cases. These things get really, really tricky to deal with and they're, they're somewhat, somewhat nebulous and get very confusing. I spend even, I know these things a lot better than most and I even find myself having to call AES to ask questions in some cases. Um, one of the things that I wanted to show you here on the zone configuration for these radios, they come out of the box bypassed and they give you two options. They give you an option for fire zones. They give you an, op uh, an option for supervised zones. Fire zones short on alarm and there's a resistor across the zone. Supervised means that there is a series through the resistor when it opens, it goes into alarm and there's no alarm or there's no trouble or alarm if you short it. It's only if it opens. So you have the ability to send, generally we send fire troubles as a supervised and we send fire alarms as a fire zone, which is short. It's a little different, means you gotta require, uh, build the zone differently. I know a lot of guys that just set them up as fire zones and then they'll short on alarm and open on trouble. Personal preference, however you wanna set them up. They're very flexible and you can pretty much do anything you want with these things. Um, let me go back over to my presentation here. Come on. That's pretty much it for the configuration. Now we're gonna get a little bit into the nuts and bolts of the flexible power pieces. Um, we talked about the flexible power a little bit, but one of the things that I've had questions in the last week from installers is what happens 
when you hook this radio up to a fire alarm panel that's putting out 24 volts, what happens is in a lot of cases, the power system on this radio will generate a ground loop or a, 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 a ground fault. So that ground fault can be solved. Stop. I think it gets, has a mind of its own. They make a board called a 77 FACPA, which is a little tiny board that goes in line with the power and isolates the unit from power. Um, that FACPA essentially just stops the ground faults on the system. If you turn suppress uh, ground fault on, there is a, a uh, button that allows you to suppress ground fault. I wouldn't recommend doing it. It's not a good idea. Go get the 77 FACPA. It's dirt cheap um, and it will definitely solve the issue. The flexible power is another thing that has become a problem in Denver. And a lot of you guys know, um, they are requiring you to use the 16 and a half volt adapter with the box in order to pass an inspection. Now, another little caveat that has come up in Denver is they will only allow the three 16 and a half volt transformers that are listed in the UL certification, which is on page 15 of the 7707 manual. Elk, MG Electronic Sales, and AES are the only three transformers that they will approve. You will fail your inspection if you don't have one of these three devices in the city and county of Denver. I don't know about other locations, but in the city and county of Denver, it has to be one of those three. When you order your radio, I'd recommend just ordering AES transformers. They're not expensive and they'll just send it with a radio. Problem solved, you don't have to worry about it anymore. This, this is new information in in the last week. So that's definitely something you wanna pay attention to. All right, so there is a new device out. I've got it sitting right here. This is a hybrid subscriber unit. The hybrid subscriber unit, you'll notice, not only does it have the regular antenna, but it also has this other little antenna over on the side. This hybrid subscriber unit, it says hybrid up here, and it looks very similar to a regular radio. There's another box that's right here that's an antenna cut unit. Um, that antenna cut unit allows you to determine if the antenna is working properly. These units are starting to appear in the network. They don't, they don't, they don't work like a regular subscriber unit. You will cause problems in the network if you do not pay attention. We have a few dealers that are out there deploying these things and they cause problems with the network, they cause problems with subscriber units, and they skew our traffic stats tremendously to the point that you're gonna start getting phone calls saying, hey, why is your unit not working right? One of the most important things that you need to remember is that first off, you try to wire it to solid internet. It has a wireless connector on it. Resist the urge to use wireless. Wireless is never as robust as a wire. You can install a wireless backup and they give you the option in software to toggle, use wired primary and wireless as backup. That's fine, but every time they change their SSID or something on their network, this unit is gonna go down. It's not stable. The wired network has issues. I don't think that the software is quite ready for prime time on the hybrid units yet. In fact, this one used to be installed at my house. I took it out because it was not working properly. We had another radio yesterday that was a hybrid unit that we installed and we're going to go replace it with this unit because the ethernet communication failed. Um, always, always, 
always put these units on an outside antenna. Do not use this goofy little 2 dBi antenna. It becomes network infrastructure. That network infrastructure requires a level of reliability that is not the same as a normal subscriber unit. These little rubber ducks have a hard time working with the, the network reliability testing unit. This little thing right here, there's a little silver box that mounts in here that connects up, that checks to see whether the antenna is connected. If it's connected to the, the rubber duck, it falses a lot. About, well, I would say 2% of the time this thing is gonna send an alarm. And that 2% causes issues with subscribers going elsewhere to try to find their connectivity. And if that hybrid subscriber unit is the only route to the central station, all of a sudden you stranded a network customer. Not a good idea. Put a little bit of time in, put a little bit of money in, and get a real outside antenna on this thing. When you get it set up, make sure that you have a net count of five on the device and that there is more than two paths to the central station. That's gonna go back to more antenna. If you don't have more than two paths to the central station, you could have a problem if one of those paths goes down. Even though this thing is connected to the internet and transmitting signals via the internet, it has to see a path to the central station on this antenna. Remote locations, this thing is not good for because it's not going to have a path to the central station unless it can talk to them on this, this radio. You it's just like putting in any other subscriber unit. The same rules apply. More than two connections to the central station and a net count of five, it's, it's ugly. If you don't have a net count of five, it's going to report it as a communications fault and it's gonna call it a redundant communications fault and it's gonna start sending notifications to you for you to go fix it. Um, if you start getting notifications from the antenna cut on, on these radios, you're affecting the network reliability and you could damage the radio. Pay attention. This goes back to Jessica's comment about what happens if the customer won't let us do a service call. Guess what? You put this thing in, you own it. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to mess up the network reliability. Go fix it. On any alarms of any kind on a hybrid subscriber unit, they all skew the reliability of the network. Go solve the problem. It could be catastrophic. You could end up killing somebody. I'm being completely serious here. Solve the problems. Don't, don't just ignore them. I know that you really want to be able to bill a customer to do this stuff, but is it worth a person's life for you to get your service call fee? I don't think so. Pay attention to that. I'm very serious. So AES has a tool that we use to manage the network and it's the NMS, Network Management Software. It shows anything that can cause problems in the network, um, it shows the subscribers that are incorrectly installed, it, it shows the low batteries, it shows the communications fails, it shows the netcon issues, and it shows the culprits very clearly. What you're seeing here is the main screen on the network management software. It's showing you a network percentage reliability of 90%, um, and it's showing you that the number of signals that were received in the last 24 hours is 12,720. What you're seeing here with this heartbeat looking thing, this is peak signals, this is the lowest number of signals during the day. This red line down at the bottom is the number of not acknowledged signals at a time. So an act delay, that's how long it takes. It's taking longer than normal for the signal to get to the central station and it will report it as an act delay. And it usually runs at any one point in time, about 10 
and it'll peak out somewhere up around 50. This peak that you see here is about 50. Doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem with the network. It just means that certain radios are having a hard time communicating with the central station. And what does that go back to? More antenna! All right, on the right hand side, it's showing, come on, stop this. Gotta get a new mouse. On the right hand side of the screen, it's got this window here. It's showing battery problems. And this is the same 60 problems that have been chronic for the last five years. They need to be resolved. And you guys are the bottom line for resolving these things. Every one of these batteries can cause problems in the network for power failures. Problems with the modem chip and the radio. There's a bad radio out there. RAM data, another one's probably the same radio as this. It may have been hit by lightning. It may have a problem. That radio needs to be looked at. It needs to go back to AES to get solved. AE AC fail right here is being reported. That radio can't keep working with an AC fail. So what they've done is they've wired it up differently and they have not turned on suppress AC fail. It's small configuration issues in the network. Right here, the netcon level in there, it's showing 99 customers out there that have network connectivity problems. That's out of, I think, 4,000 subscribers. Let me, let me bring up the network management system here and I'll share it with you. All right, so what you're going to see here as soon as this comes up, this is live. This data is from right now. Notice the network percentage is at 66, and that's being skewed by a couple of subscribers, and I'll get into that here in a second. It's currently monitoring nine IP links and 4,147 subscribers. Here's the network pulse that you saw before, and here's the act delays. When that red line crosses the blue line, that's when there's a problem. And that rarely, rarely ever happens. But if you look at these, you can look at the customers and this system allows you to drill down. Let me get this screen shared because it opens a new window. You can drill down and see the subscribers who have those problems. And it's telling us when this problem was reported last time. So some of these, here's one that was reported for Colorado Academy on 10-7 at 9.55. That was five days ago. So that's probably been recovered since then. It, it, it's likely been touched. But this is available for your dealer so that you can touch your subscriber units and see all of the subscriber units that have a problem for you. Very nice to have. Um, some of the information may be um, stale. Like it, it keeps a lot of this information for a while. Like network connectivity, having network connectivity this will show you all of the radios that need more antennas. And that number fluctuates from 75 up to about 120. And it's those radios that change all the time that need to be touched, especially the ones that never change. But the ones that fluctuate, they're right on the ragged edge. And this, this is a really nice tool and it tells you exactly what's going on on the network. It also tells you the offenders. You'll see up here that it shows signals received in the last 24 hours. It shows 16,631. Let me drill down here into this share and you can see exactly what I'm seeing. But this is all of the subscribers that talk a lot. And Normally, a subscriber should send two signals a day, timer tests. That's all they should ever send. 
And these are in the last 24 hours, okay? This customer here, which you'll notice there's no name and address here. This is a new subscriber that has been fired up by a dealer that has not populated information on it, yet it's sending signals. There's 727 signals that were dumped to the network in the last 24 hours. These other subscribers, 545, 434, 401, 314, 239, they're spewing problems. Anytime you have a subscriber unit that is generating alarms and sending them through to the central station, it affects the reliability of the network and therefore the reliability that you're seeing for your customers. Take them seriously. Same problem. Generates noise. Any noise on this network is bad. Now, what you're seeing down here at the bottom is hybrid subscriber units. The redundant communications. Now, this one is one that I touched yesterday. It is a hybrid subscriber unit that has failed and it has started generating redundant communications errors, which means IP, and there is nothing that we can do about it because the radio has had a problem. So this unit, when I'm done with this today, is going to be installed in that location to cure that redundant communications failure. Now here's another one, radio silence. Uh, radio silence is when there is no antenna on the subscriber unit or the antenna has been broken. It's also showing an antenna cut, which means that radio is still turned on, it's still out there in the network, and it doesn't have an antenna on it. First off, that's going to kill the radio. The little silver box that I showed you earlier that's inside this thing, on this side of the radio, right, right here, this silver box is the actual transmitter. If you don't have an antenna on that transmitter, it will burn up. They're $150 a piece. That's an awfully expensive fuse. I did mention uh, there's an anonymous attendee that popped up here. It says, did you mention that reports for each dealer's subscribers are available to us? If so, how do we get those? Um, do you want to say something about that, Michelle? Yes, um, just contact either myself, Tony Chameau, or Mike Lample, and we can help you with that. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, so one of the things that we wanted you to know is that this information is available to you. It's very important to have this and it's very important to have somebody in your organization looking at this on a regular basis, knowing what's going on with your customers. Um, I consider it to be one of the most important tools in the toolbox when trying to deal with AES. Um, I find myself using it literally multiple times a day and paying attention to that stuff even one time a day, making it somebody's job to follow up on these things and try to clear the problem children, very, very, very important. Um, one of the things that I see as a hot button is paying attention to Netcon and batteries. If you can solve Netcon and batteries on this network and start bringing these numbers down, the reliability of this network is going to go up tremendously. And right, right now, as you saw, the network reliability was at 66, and that was because of hybrid units. But uh, we're trying to resolve those. We've contacted the dealer that has the problem with the radio silence and the antenna cut, and we're trying to get those taken care of. They're all in your power to control. I'd recommend trying to resolve them as soon as possible. I try not to, in most cases, when these things pop up, I don't generally wait more than a couple of days. We had one pop up with the redundant comm last Thursday, and we were there yesterday to solve it. And that's, I, I try to do it as soon as possible because it tremendously affects this network in the way that it carries traffic. 
Um, any subscriber units that pop up that have problems, this, this tool will show them to you. You can find it very easily. Um, the resources that I would suggest that you look at, there is a tool that I have trained. I trained South Metro, um, West Metro, and North Metro, their fire marshals. I've trained them with this guide that you see here. It is included in the packet of information that was given to you. Um, I would highly suggest you spend a little bit of time and read through that. That document shows exactly how to test, and that is the document that the AHJs are going to use in most cases to do fire inspections. So you're going to know the test before you get there. I would encourage you to learn it. I would encourage you to spend enough time to know it better than they do. It's not difficult. It's two pages. It's very clear. It's very concise. And it's very step by step showing you how to go through this document. Um, I, would, I would highly recommend that uh, you look through any of these documents, especially the 7707 Fire Manual and the AHJ resources. Um, those two, there's a wealth of information there that can really be helpful to you. And they really look at the way this stuff was tested by the UL and anything in that manual that says that it needs to be done in those devices, they're gonna pretty much hold you to that. This was a very basic overview of how to touch this stuff, how to get friendly with it, and how to get used to it. And I know it was very fast, but now is the time for questions. If you guys have them, please uh, hit me. Let me know what, uh, what you have, and we'll try to cover them as much as we can. It was good getting the questions that we had. I uh, really appreciate it. I have trained North Metro, South Metro, and West Metro. Um, I did train Cunningham, but now they're South Metro also. So that's essentially the same. Um, we had almost 100 AHJs in each of the meetings, and it was, it was brutal. It was about four hours of them beating me up trying to get me to answer questions. and. They all walked out with a very good idea of where to go. Every one of them walked out with a copy of the fire marshal resources document that you see here. And it is available on AES's webpage. And I would encourage you to spend a little bit of time and read it. A lot of the things that we went through today, it goes into in more depth than we went into today. I don't see any more questions here. Anybody else have anything that they want to add? The CMS folks? I don't have anything to add. I appreciate your time today, John. Glad to do it. It always helps. Trying it to, does. Trying to demystify the crystal ball. <laughs> so true. So true. Mike, do you have anything? No, I understand from um, uh, Jennifer that we um, recorded this, so for dealers that uh, uh, weren't able to listen to every aspect of it, uh, they can go back. Uh, we'll get that link out to you guys shortly, uh, so you guys can go back and, and review it. And we're, we're going to try to stay on top of this. Um, I think we try to do this at least twice a year. Um, there is a question that popped up there. I'm trying to see where it is. There we go. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. He says uh, it was an outstanding training. I'd be interested in another session on outdoor antennas. Um, send an email to me. Uh, it's John M at csalarm.com. And I will try to put something together to train on outside antennas and how to properly install them. And if you guys want to attend something like that, um, I can't really do it virtually. It's going to have to be in person. We can do it somewhere in town. Um, 
I'm not terribly scared of the virus, but I would be glad to come out and make sure that uh, we get you what you need in order to be able to figure out how the pieces fit together, because that is somewhat critical. And I've been doing it, I've been in the RF business for almost 35 years. So it's, uh, it's definitely an art and there's a lot of science to it and you don't really need to know those pieces. I can make it fairly simple for you. All right. Well, Thanks, thank John. You. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. You're yes. very welcome. Yeah, right. I hope everyone out there has a good day. And, and again, if you have any questions, don't uh, hesitate to either email myself or Michelle uh, or John from his email address, and we'll get those answered for you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks.